I have a friend who I've known for almost 20 years. We have never gotten along particularly splendidly. There was an exchange of emails last year that I intensified and eventually got an email back from him saying, I've never seen you so upset. We need to talk about this face to face. No more email. So he came in and sat down across the desk from me and said, what was that last email about? And I said, well, I was trying to get your attention, and I think it worked. And I was able to get him to hear something that he had not been able to hear for 10 years that I'd been trying to tell him. This is part of the art of fathering, where punishment or discipline, whatever you want to call it, is not necessarily anchored in the severity of the crime so much as it is in the hardness of the heart. When Aaron and Miriam engaged in overt, flagrant public racism, God struck Miriam with leprosy. And let me tell you, that is way harsh. It wasn't just a blemish on her cheek. Head to toe, she was covered with an advanced stage of leprosy, which would have required her to be outside the camp, sentenced to isolation, and ultimately a lonely, painful, brutal death. Pretty harsh. Here in the States, racism is taken for granted. Oh, we have a few token laws that you don't use this word or that word. Um, but by and large, racism is alive and well, practiced every day with impunity. And we would be shocked if God did something like that to one of us for racism. And yet, it would probably require something of that magnitude to get our attention regarding racism. Because we are so calloused to it, we are so accustomed to living in a culture that accommodates racism, perpetuates racism, establishes racism, that we are no longer offended by it in the way God is offended. Therefore, to break through our callousness would require a pretty severe trauma to get our attention. I remember a story that Jim Sammons tells on his uh, teachings on financial freedom. There was a particular piece of property that they developed, and this strip mall was cursed like really cursed. They lost money on it. They couldn't get a tenant in there. When they did get tenants in, one of them was a clothing tenant, and people would barge into the store in broad daylight, gather up armfuls of clothes, and blatantly run out the door. I mean, it was the most out of control piece of property they ever had. I believe it was officially named Meadowbrook, but in the weekly and monthly leadership staff meetings at the company, it became known as Meadow Dog. And month after month, year after year, there was anguish over what are we going to do with Meadow Dog? What are we going to do to get liquidity? How can we get rid of it? And so on. Eventually, one day, it did sell. And for the close of escrow, Jim Sammons personally went down to the attorney's office to be absolutely positively certain that every last facet of escrow was closed, perfect completely, so that he never had to deal with Meadow Dog again. And as he and his vice president walked away from that successful closing, and he shook his head over the enormity of the losses that one property had caused him, his partner said, or his vice president said, you know, I think I know why God let that happen. And Jim said, oh, really? And this fellow said, well, I think there was sin in this area that we handled it. And Jim uh, pondered it for a while and finally could concede that that might have been the root. And then the VP said, I think I know why it went on this long. And Jim said, oh, really? Well, I'd like to hear that too, I think. And the VP said, 
I think God wanted to be absolutely sure that we would never forget this lesson and do it again. And Jim said, if that was God's objective, he achieved it because he can be absolutely sure I will never forget about Metal Dog till the day I die. Sometimes in an area of our pervasive sin, in an area where our heart has been hard for so long that there are no longer any pangs of conscience, God deals with us in a very, very severe way, not because of the enormity of the crime, but because of the hardness of our hearts. So as sons, when a harsh, harsh thing comes into our life, when the punishment vastly exceeds the consequences, we should not, or the vastly exceeds this original sin, we should not begin whining about injustice. That is a slave's reaction. Rather, we need to take a step back and say, okay, um, clearly God knows what he's doing. Clearly, this is not about justice because the punishment is unjust. So clearly, there's something in my heart that is so deep and so calloused that a scalpel won't work and God has to use a sledgehammer to get my attention. What is this root thing that is beyond the surface problem that I'm aware of that is causing me to have to endure this great pain? It is so vital for us as sons to justify God. It is vital for us to say, God does no wrong ever under any circumstances. There has to be a reason why three of us together doing the same thing, this one gets a slap on the wrist, this one gets off scot-free, and I get hammered with the whole thing. It can't all be the Aramean curse. And as we look inside, often we will find that there's a deeply rooted issue that God wants to root out. With Aaron and Miriam, I'm not sure whether the root issue that offended God was the racism or whether it was their lack of reverence for the authority structure God had put in place. Either way, God wanted to make absolute certain that it was a lesson that was never forgotten. And there's every evidence that from that point on, Aaron and Miriam behave themselves in a slightly different way. As a father, you cannot treat all of your people equally. You must not. It's dangerous to treat all of your children equally because they just have hugely different internal dynamics. I remember marveling at the difference in mom treating my brother Tim and my younger sister, Lois. Tim was a ruler. Lois was a mercy. Tim would get some pretty solid wax on his behind, and Lois would dissolve into a puddle of tears when Mother glared at her slightly. I'm not sure Lois ever got a respectable spanking in her whole life didn't need the spankings all of her older brothers got because she was in a different place. She had a different heart. And a mild criticism, scolding over here, accomplished as much, or more, I dare say, as the Board of Education applied to the seat of learning accomplished with her brothers. So as a son, when the punishment is disproportionate to the sin, look inside and find out what heinous thing God is trying to break out of your calloused heart. As a father, meet out judgment uniquely from child to child, from employee to employee, factoring in not just the severity of the crime, but also the hardness or the tenderness of heart of the one you're disciplining.